James Buchanan, representative of the state of New Jersey in the House of Representatives, stood on the House floor in 1886 to make a passionate argument for the creation of more life-saving stations along the coast. To show the sacrifice that some of the people who were already employed by the service had made, he brought with him a table showing the casualties of the service. The first names on this list were from March 1st, 1876. The first casualties of the service had been seven men who had attempted the rescue of the crew of the Nuova Ottavia off the coast of North Carolina. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? The Failed Rescue of the Nuova Ottavia. Here we are. Enjoy! No one was entirely certain about how it was that the Nuova Ottavia had come to grief. Even the precise nature of the vessel had been debated, with American sources calling her a three-masted bark, and an Italian source calling the ship a two-masted brigantine. The 468-ton wooden vessel had been built in 1862 and was registered in Genoa. She was no stranger to the east coast of the United States, and on January 6, 1876, she departed in ballast, bound for Baltimore. She was under the command of Captain Bazzo David and her 13 crew members. In addition to the crew and captain, Captain David's wife and child were also traveling on board. We do not know much about the voyage of the ship until she reached the coast of North Carolina, though it seems to have been without much incident. The first that we hear about the Nuova Ottavia on reaching the coast was the sentinel on watch at life-saving station number 4, the Jones Hill station, around sunset on March 1st, 1876. He saw the ship in the distance, about five miles southeast of the station, on a course taking her to the north. The weather was cloudy and dark, and the waves were choppy, but the conditions were not bad enough for the ship to be having any difficulties. The ship being sighted was noted, and the watch continued. Only two hours later, around seven o'clock at night, with darkness having fallen and fog having moved in, the sentinel of the life-saving station realized that the same ship that he had seen before was now only 400 yards from the station. The exact events that led to the accident of the Nuova Ottavia coming so close to shore are somewhat shrouded in mystery. But with all of her sails unfurled, even as she found herself in distress, no one believed her to have found herself in difficulties due to the stormy weather. She had no appearance of a ship in distress, except for one important detail. She had gone hard aground on a sandbar. The sandbar was a well-known navigational hazard. Only four months before the Nuova Ottavia had grounded, the Curatuck Beach Lighthouse had been completed to warn of the very sandbank that Nuova Ottavia had come to grief on. Indeed, though the lighthouse was now illuminated, they were still in the act of building the lighthouse keeper's residence, and there were still construction workers on site. Prior to the lighthouse's completion, it was noted that 56 vessels had gone ashore there in the space of 22 years. For this same reason, the Jones Hill Life Saving Station had also been created. The two year old station was under the command of Keeper John G. Gale. The keeper was considered a steady and careful man, someone who would make the right decisions to save any ship that was unfortunate enough to come ashore, just as the Nuova Ottavia had done. With the news that there was work to do, Keeper Gale mustered his crew of men. The complete crew was made of six men, Spencer Gray, Lemuel Griggs, Louis White, 
Malachi Brumsey, Jerry Munden, and John Chapel. John Chapel was absent, though. He had been sent to Tulls Creek for supplies. As the crew was mustered, men who were part of the operation and construction of the lighthouse began to gather and offer their assistance. Keeper Gale asked for a volunteer to join the crew of the surf boat to take Chapel's place, and several men volunteered. The superintendent of construction at the lighthouse, a man named Lewis, offered his services. Another man associated with the lighthouse, the clerk on staff named Halstead, also stepped forward and even climbed into the boat. In the end, it was decided that a man named George Wilson, who was part of the construction crew, would go instead. He was the strongest and the youngest out of those who volunteered, and it was felt that he would be the most helpful to have along. There would later be questions about everything that had happened. Though the lifeboat was described as having passed beautifully through the breakers, there was not necessarily a need for them to go out in the boat at all. It was dark, but the ship was close enough to shore that they should have at least attempted a breech buoy with the Lyle gun that all of the life-saving stations had before risking a boat in such rough seas. Attaching a line to the boat and pulling the people on the wreck to shore that way was generally considered a safer form of rescue. Much of this has been attributed to the lack of experience that the life-saving crew had. Though the station had been open for two years, the entire crew had not all been stationed there for that long, and the station was only open seasonally, meaning that their training time was even more limited. Indeed, it was later noted that the wreck of the Nuova Ottavia had occurred three days after the start of the active season of employment for the men at the life-saving station. The men of the Jones Hill station clearly took their positions as lifesavers very seriously, though, and the boat was obviously the course of action that would allow them to reach the crew that was endangered the fastest, even if it was not as safe. It was soon found that the inexperienced crew had also overlooked something else that was vitally important. Some of the crew of the Nuova Ottavia would later give the following statement to the superintendent of the life-saving service who was investigating the incident. The surfboat pulled entirely around the Nuova Ottavia so that they could attach a line to the lee side of the ship. The men on the boat held onto this line, but allowed it too much slack and the surfboat was brought under the bow of the ship, where the sea was pounding. As the waves struck the bow of the ship, they rebounded, crashing into the surfboat, filling it and overturning it. The life-saving crew found themselves all in the rough sea, where the other thing they had overlooked became clear quickly. Not one of them had been wearing their cork life preservers, which were issued to all of the men on the life-saving service it would be a fatal omission. For the people on shore, the horrified realization came slowly. They had watched as the surfboat pulled away with strong and steady strokes. They had watched as the lantern of the boat had bobbed out of sight in the fog and darkness. And then there had only been the sound of the sails of the Nuova Ottavia flapping in the wind until there was a sudden shrill scream that cut through the night. First, one of the surfboat oars drifted ashore, then a second, and a third. And then the surfboat washed up, still flipped over and empty. For the people on shore, the wait had become a vigil as members of the community waited to see what had happened to their friends and family who had gone out in the boat. When the body of Malachi Brumsey washed ashore that night, it must have been a blow to those on shore. With the life-saving station no longer occupied by anyone and left open, the crowd rushed to find anything that might be of use. Through the night, they fired rockets belonging to the station into the air to try to encourage the people they knew were still on the Nuova Ottavia, and reassure them that they had not been abandoned.
when the long-awaited dawn broke, it came with some answers. The Nuova Ottavia was still on the sandbank, though it was starting to show signs of breaking up under the pounding of the waves. On the deck, the people on shore could see eight men still on board her. The rest had presumably been washed away in the night. The eight men were all grouped together on the deck, but among their number was someone that the people on shore could recognize. It was one of the surfmen, Spencer Gray. Spencer Gray had been living in the community since 1875, when he had joined the life-saving crew. The locals could spot his stoop and his balding head, even from such a distance. Meanwhile, the remains of those who had been thrown into the ocean began to come ashore. Keeper Gale, Surfman Griffs and White, and the volunteer Wilson were all taken from the beach, where they washed up about a mile from station number four and returned to their families. Five members of the crew of the Nuova Ottavia were also washed ashore, and since they were so far from home and never fully identified, they were laid to rest about 300 yards from the station. For the people on the beach, though, the living were of the greatest importance. Throughout the day, the people on the beach, both local members of the community and people who were working on the lighthouse, fired the Lyle gun that they had also taken from the life-saving station, trying to get a line to the ship. There was plenty of shot and line available for them to make the attempt, but none of them had been trained in using the device. All of the people who did know how to use a Lyle gun had been in the surf boat when it had headed out to the Nuova Ottavia. After four shots, the vent of the mortar was entirely clogged with sand and no longer usable, and not one of the shots had been well enough aimed for a line to land on the Nuova Ottavia. There was still no way for those on the beach to help the men on the ship. The ship continued to break up around the men who were huddled on her deck, even as the people on shore watched helplessly. Still, they fired rockets as a means of encouragement, and a later report by the superintendent of the service reported that, in total, 41 rockets had been fired by the people on the beach. By two in the afternoon, the Nuova Ottavia could no longer be seen above water. A group of men from the lighthouse had rushed to bring men from the next life-saving station, station number five, which was approximately seven miles away. They brought back Keeper Partridge and two of his men to help, but it was too late for the newcomers to do much other than join the others in rushing to shore to render aid when some of the wreckage washed ashore in the shape of rafts. On board of these makeshift rafts were four members of the crew of the Nuova Ottavia, the only survivors. Spencer Gray, though he had managed somehow to reach the deck of the ship, would also never return to shore. The four members of the Italian crew were all in too rough of condition to begin answering questions immediately. The survivors were made up of the ship's second mate and three of the sailors. Two of them were completely exhausted. One of them was badly injured from a nail from the wreckage. One of the survivors was speaking in Italian, but the things coming from his mouth were nonsense and not in response to any questions that he was asked. He was clearly in a complete state of shock. The fourth man required immediate resuscitation, and he was not out of danger until nightfall. It was from these men that the superintendent of the life-saving service learned how the surfboat had come to wreck, but not how the Nuova Ottavia had come to grief on the sandbank in the first place. None of the men spoke English, and no one in the area seems to have spoken Italian. The barebone story seems to have been primarily told through pantomime. The stern of the Nuova Ottavia washed ashore about 20 miles away from the Jones Hill Station, near Kitty Hawk. Here it was reported that it seems as though it might have been charred, leading to speculation that there had been a fire on the Nuova Ottavia and that Captain David had driven the ship on shore on purpose. 
in the Baltimore Sun, an article that claimed to be the testimony of the second mate came to light with its own version. In it, he said that since it had been so cloudy, they had not been able to determine their position, and the newly built Currituck Lighthouse was not on their charts, leading them to mistake their position and make the disastrous error in navigation. The Baltimore Sun was the only paper to publish such a statement, though, and since it was around the same time that newspapers were alleging that the reason that the surf boat capsized was because the Italian crew had rushed into it and upset it, the newspaper articles surrounding the incident must be met with some skepticism. Though it cannot be certain if this statement was ever made by the second mate, the idea that the wreck was the fault of the newly built lighthouse, which had been built to warn of the very sandbank the Nuova Ottavia had wrecked on, is the most widely held theory of the wreck. The official report of the wreck from the Life Saving Service simply says that the Nuova Ottavia came to shore not due to the weather, but either through a mistake in course or through deliberate grounding. For the Life Saving Service as well as the United States government as a whole, what mattered was that the wreck had cost them almost an entire station of men. There could be no fault found with the equipment that the men had, indeed. On inspecting the surf boat, it was found that it could be repaired with only $10, having only split a plank, and that even in the condition that it was in when it washed ashore, it could be seaworthy in an emergency as it was. Instead, the focus was placed on the fact that none of the men who had gone out had been wearing their life preservers. That the members of the crew of the Nova Ottavia had washed ashore on their makeshift rafts was used as a demonstration that had the life-saving crew been wearing flotation devices, they too could have washed ashore safely. Though the superintendent was careful to place the blame of this oversight on the men's urge to go to the rescue of the crew of the Nuova Ottavia as quickly as possible, a new notice was still sent out to all of the other life-saving crews. The wearing of life preservers when going out in a surf boat, no matter how urgent the situation, was not optional. It was henceforth required. The superintendent of the life-saving service also went out of his way to mention that the men who had sacrificed themselves to try to save the people on the Nuova Ottavia left behind widows and children. The Italian government took note of this as well. $408 in gold was sent through the Consul General of Italy for the support of the families who had been left behind with instructions for $78 of it to go to the family of Keeper Gale, and $55 to go to the families of each of the other men. The Nuova Ottavia, and the loss of the crew of Station No. 4, would start other discussions as well. It was brought up on the floor of the house how shameful it was that while the Italian government had sent money for the support of the families who had been left behind, the United States government did not offer a pension for the families of people who were lost in the life-saving service. These were men who were risking their lives. Surely they were owed the same benefits as other men who risked their lives serving their country in either the army or navy. The Nuova Ottavia also brought to the public's attention that the wages of servemen in the life-saving service was only $20 a month. Even in landlocked states like Tennessee, this was called out by newspapers as a shameful amount to give men who were out in all weather and ready to risk themselves to save their fellow man. Though the life-saving service had already been evolving into a larger and more organized service, the loss of the Jones Hill Station crew would bring yet more changes that would allow the service to continue its work for saving hundreds of lives of shipwrecked sailors. For more information, please see the annual report of the operations of the United States Life Saving Service for the fiscal year 
ending June 30th, 1876. Or see your other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.